The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Yaron Brook Show on uh, this uh, Saturday. Oh, no, it's Sunday already. I skipped the show on Saturday. I skipped the show yesterday. Sorry about that. A little, uh, little tired. But uh, thanks you for joining me today on this, uh, on this Sunday. And... Um, Hope you're having a great weekend. All right, um, a few, we're going to cover, we'll see how many topics we cover today. Partially depends on the kind of questions you ask on Super Chat and stuff, but uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Pensacola shooting, uh, and and then I want to get to this uh, video of Mark Cuban that was sent to me for comment, and, you know, it's just the same old stuff of, Billionaires defending themselves, and then maybe we'll get to a uh, a uh, Richard Wolf video and uh, comment on it. So, uh, but uh, also feel free to indulge in uh, super chat questions if you uh, feel up to it. So, as you probably know, um, there was a shooting in Pensacola at a, at a, a military base. Uh, you know what's interesting about it? You know, three people are dead and number of people and injured, which is horrific. The shooter himself was killed. Um, but what is, what is truly, uh, what, is tr- what makes this interesting versus other shootings is who the shooter was. And the shooter was a Saudi Arabian uh, Air Force officer, second lieutenant, who was in the United States for training. In the United States for training, uh, you know, by, by, I guess, the United States Air Force. And he's one of, you know, hundreds of potentially thousands of Saudis who are in the United States who are serving in their Saudi Arabia's military and who the United States is training uh, in flying in, in whatever, you know, military competence. And so note, so this is the latest terrorist attack by what appears to be, I mean, we don't have all the Evidence, but what appears to be an you know America hating Israel hating Islamist, but here it is somebody who didn't come in, didn't sneak across the border, a wall wouldn't have stopped him. It isn't somebody who um, came in on a visa and and was uh, you know vetted. This is somebody who was invited in, invited in as a as a Saudi military. Officer. Now, what makes, you know, what's interesting about this is is the idea that if you're really concerned about terrorism, Islamic terrorism, then you don't build walls. You don't ban Muslims from certain countries, like Trump did early on in his administration. Ten countries, none of which have ever produced any terrorists. But you strategically look at your enemy. You evaluate them. You figure out who they are. You identify them first. Then you evaluate them. You figure out their weaknesses. And you basically destroy them. So the only way to deal with terrorism is to go and destroy your enemies. It cannot be that the way to deal with terrorism is to train the military of one of the two largest sponsors of terrorism. It cannot be that one invites into your own country the military of a country who on every Friday in the mosques are calling for the death of Americans in the establishment of an Islamic empire throughout the world, as the Wahhabis do. And, and granted, Saudi Arabia has been moderated in recent times, and some of those Wahhabis are sitting in jail, but only marginally, and is it sustainable? Saudi Arabia is not our friend. And as long as Saudi Arabia, and indeed Saudi Arabia is, if one evaluates the situation, as I have been doing since 9-11, Saudi Arabia is our enemy in the struggle, as is Iran. 
And one does not invite our enemy's troops to be trained by our own troops. I mean, that is suicide. That is suicide. Now, it's not suicide completely in the sense that America is so powerful and so big that the Saudis are not going to destroy us. But it certainly is. It certainly is. Going to get Americans killed. And, and the Americans in Pensacola got killed because we invite enemy soldiers into our country. Now, most of them are fine because the regime in Saudi Arabia knows better than to advocate directly for the destruction of America and to fight us directly. They basically have outsourced it to all kinds of charities and all kinds of other institutions that do the dirty work. But there's no question about the connection between Saudi Arabian charities, Saudi, members of the royal family in Saudi Arabia, members of the Saudi intelligence, and terrorism. And yet we ignore it. We do nothing about it. We pretend that they're our friends. Our president goes dancing with his sheiks. And... We invite them in to train them to become better soldiers. And all it takes is one of them, or right now they're looking, I think, for another person. They were detaining about 10. So I don't know exactly what's going to come of it. It could be just a lone person. It just be, could be just him. But you've got to calculate that in a certain percentage of Saudis, given what they're taught, given what they advocate, given what the state religion is and how it is practiced that a certain percentage of Saudis are going to be violent. You don't train them militarily. It's just nuts. That is just nuts. And of course, if you're going to have a Muslim ban, you don't have a Muslim ban in all countries excluding Saudi Arabia. I mean, that was, that was a reflection of, of, of what happened back there. Now, Luckily, I mean, I had to say luckily in this context, but it, it, it is not a major terrorist event. Uh, thousands of people were not killed. But it is tragic that three people had to die for nothing because we have an incoherent, unprincipled foreign policy practiced by all sides, same foreign policy under Democrats and Republicans. It hasn't really mattered. Saudi Arabia is our friend no matter who is in the White House, no matter who is in Congress it's exactly the same outcome. Until we wake up to the realities of the Middle East, until we are willing, have the courage, the self-esteem, the backbone to define our enemies and our friends, support our friends and reject our enemies, these kind of things will continue and they will, they will be worse in the future. All right. Um, but of course, you know, this will just be more excuse for people to shout for a wall for more limits on immigration, even though this has nothing to do with immigration, nothing even to do with Muslim immigration. All right. Let's see. Uh, oh, so I wanted to talk about, I mean, there's not a lot for me to say about Pensacola other than that, really. Um, I, uh, if anybody wants to, as I said, if anybody wants to use the super chat feature, I am, um, I'm available to answer your questions today. Okay, let me shift now, shift a little focus to, uh, to the attack on billionaires and, uh, and Mark Cuban. And uh, Mark Cuban was brought on Fox News to kind of defend capitalism, to defend billionaires, to talk about health care. And, uh, you know, somebody sent me, actually Christian sent me... Uh, the video of a couple of leftists talking about this interview. And I have to admit, and, and Christian warned me, but I mean, it was so vulgar. And, it, you know, it was the F word, every second word. And, it, you know, couldn't, couldn't really even, I, you know, I couldn't play it for you. I apologize. I'm, I'm a, when it comes to language, I just don't, it's just, it's just offensive and stupid. And they were so stupid in their commentary. And Mark Cuban is so deserving of criticism that I, I, I'm much more interested in attacking Mark Cuban than I am in attacking those crazy leftists. Because anybody who watched it could have seen how empty, 
shallow, stupid they really were. You know, I think it was uh, something atheist, something atheist, anyway. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll look at other videos of theirs and see if, because they've got a huge following. They've got like one point something million subscribers. And actually more people have watched, I think, this Mark Cuban interview through their criticism of it than have watched it directly on Fox Business's uh, YouTube channel. So you can see the kind of influence they have. But man, it was just, just a way, I mean, anybody who doesn't see through that, there's nothing I can do to help them. So I'll, I'll look to see if there's something a little bit more rational that they produce that is worth commenting on. All right, let's take on Mark Cuban. I mean, Mark Cuban's pretty pathetic. Um, obviously, Mark Cuban's self-made billionaire, comes from a true, comes from a working class family, got into the internet very early. Basically, I think it was internet, kind of internet radio, uh, music, uh, over online, sold to Yahoo at the peak of the bubble. Unlike many others, didn't keep his stock, didn't invest massively in dot-com thinking it would go up, but implicitly or explicitly recognized that there was a bubble and basically took his money out, out of the market. And ultimately uh, is best known for having invested in the Dallas Mavericks and becoming the owner of uh, the Dallas Mavericks and, and being quite visible out there as a billionaire since then. Uh, he, he, basically, that was the one transaction that made him. I'm sure he makes money at the Dallas Mavericks. I'm sure he's made some other good investments that have just fueled his billionaire status. But the real big thing was, was he, he, he got on the Internet early, he made a lot of money and he was smart enough because I knew a lot of people who became very, very rich for a few months and then basically lost most of it. He did not because he was smart enough to get out. Um, so he is on Fox. He's actually sitting, you'll see him sitting ne right next to Steve Forbes, who is much better at defending capitalism than Mark Cuban, but also pretty weak. And... Um, we will watch and see how he addresses Medicare for all and socialism and, and defense capitalism. Cuban is here. He has been a capitalist his whole life, and he actually started with nothing yeah. and became a billionaire because of hard work and just smarts. And luck. And, and luck. luck. It does always. Yeah, I mean, they always emphasize the luck. I mean, maybe he was lucky, too. I'm not saying he wasn't. Timing is important. But why don't you just leave it at? You came from nothing, you worked hard, and, you, and you're smart. Why do you have to undercut yourself? Why do you have to undercut yourself? By emphasizing luck. I mean, uh, Bill Gates does the same thing. Warren Buffett does the same thing. But that's because they're embarrassed. They have no self-esteem tied up in this wealth that they've created. And they feel guilty to some extent. At some level, they feel guilty. Now, Stephanie asks, has AI tried to talk to these billions? Yeah, I mean, I've exchanged emails with Mark Cuban. But he only replies with one word to my emails. Anybody know what that word would be? I mean, Mark Cuban actually answers his emails, and I have his email address somewhere. And his answer is always no. And I've asked to meet with him. The answer was no. I asked him to support the distribution among high school kids of his favorite book, The Fountainhead. And he has said, no. I've asked him to support the essay contest on The Fountainhead, his favorite book, he says. And he has said, no. To help expose young people to the book that inspired him. And he has said, no. So anyway, that's Mark Cuban. Um, so uh, immediately, it's luck, right? Let's keep going. Of yeah. course. So tell me about that. What do you think about how 2020 is shaping up and, and capitalism versus socialism? Well, I, I mean, capitalism is going to win. Capitalism is going to win. And, and, and his confidence that capitalism is going to win is not an ideological confidence. It's not comes from an understanding of capitalism. And we're going to win the, the um, intellectual debate with the socialists. His... Confidence that capitalism will win is a practical confidence. We have the money. Socialism doesn't work 
And people don't do what doesn't work. I mean, I would argue, so security doesn't work, Medicaid doesn't work, welfare doesn't work, regulations don't work, and we still do them. So there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that people actually do, actually do vote for and embrace things that don't work. But he, you know, most of these billionaires, most of these rich people who've made their money in the markets, don't believe the world will turn against markets because markets work about that but I, look no question about i'm that. never against open discourse that's what makes this com- country great you know um people being able to convey their opinions now i'm not going to agree with all of them um socialism just doesn't work um medicare for all notice it just doesn't work not wrong immoral indefensible causes people to die starve it just doesn't work now what about all the socialist stuff that we have in america today all the places in which the government intervenes in the economy that has basically adopted elements of socialism like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, welfare, and of course, the regulatory state. That works, but he's going to defend all that, actually. I I believe health care is a right. Whoa, did you hear that? She said, when it comes to Medicare for all, I agree, Medicare... Medica, uh, healthcare is a right. Well, look, that's it. Once you accept healthcare as a right, then it's over. There is no debate. Socialism has won. You can't deny people rights. If healthcare is a right, you have to provide it. And in order to provide it, you can only do it through government. And to do that, you have to use force against doctors, nurses, hospitals, and other taxpayers to take their money so that you can provide that health care. Once you've given up health care is a right, you've given up the whole debate. You've given up everything. There is nothing more to really talk about. This is Mark Cuban defending capitalism. He's on the show to defend capitalism. To argue against Medicare for all. But there is no argument against Medicare for all if health care is a right. And, you know, somebody says, how can he not defend capitalism while being on a show that shows capitalism in action, which is Shark Tank? Well, because he doesn't have the self-esteem to defend capitalism. He doesn't have the philosophical tools to the full company. Indeed, he rejects them because he's obviously read The Fountainhead, thinks it's his favorite book, but has no understanding, no understanding of what the book actually means. He won't defend individualism. He won't defend egoism. He won't defend capitalism. And he won't defend, he will defend the idea, as he just did, that healthcare is a right. Now, let's talk about what is a right. Where do rights come from? Rights are not given to us by something external. Rights are not in us as some intrinsic thing. Rights are moral principle, moral principle, that is necessary for human beings to live in a community, in society. It is a moral principle, a moral truth about the conditions necessary for human success when living in a social context. So if you believe that the individual has a right to his own life, if you believe the individual has a right to pursue his own happiness, he must be free to use his mind, to choose his values, and to act in pursuit of those values. Rights are recognition of that. Rights say you are free to act in pursuit of your rational values, in pursuit of your survival and happiness. Free of coercion, free of force, force, free of authority. You should be left alone so you can use your mind to pursue your values. 
Now, where does the right to health care come there? I mean, the rights articulated in the Declaration of Independence are clear. You have a right to life, which means to take the action necessary to sustain and to, f to live a flourishing life. You have a right to liberty, which would mean a right to think and to articulate those thoughts as you see fit, recognizing the importance of thinking, the importance of reason, the importance of knowledge, the importance of speech to your own survival. But that, not at anybody's expense. Nobody has to give up anything so that you can speak freely, write freely, think freely. And you have a right, let's say, to property. Property doesn't come at anybody else's expense. Property is something you create by your effort in voluntary interaction with other people. You can't choose force. It's not property. It's not your property. It's not private property if you used force to get it. So again, no expense of anybody else's. It's about how you need property in order to pursue your life. You need to be able to keep, to keep that which you create. That's what life necessitates. That's what your life necessitates. You need to be able to speak and you need to have property and a pursuit of happiness. Again, pursuit of happiness, free of coercion, free of force. Not anybody else's expense because happiness doesn't come at other people's expense. So, there is no right to other people's stuff to other people's work, to other people's effort, to other people's wealth. I mean, there's a sense in which there's a right to health care, but not the sense in which Mark Cuban means it. The right to health care, just like the right to anything else, is the freedom to use your mind and to use your resources to pursue the health care you need. It doesn't guarantee you anything. It just makes it possible for you to choose whatever doctor you want. Medicare for all is a violation of your right to health care because it tells you which doctor to go to. You cannot choose. You cannot select. You cannot use your mind to judge which doctor, which drug to take, which procedure to engage in. No, some government bureaucrat gets to tell you all of that. So a right to health care is a right to freely choose, to freely engage in market transactions, to Go to any doctor who's willing to trade with you, to engage with any hospital willing to trade with you, to buy whatever drugs a drug company or pharmacy is willing to sell you. The right to health care is a right to engage in voluntary transactions that enhance your health care. It's a freedom. But that's not what's meant. What's meant here is the right to health care means you get to be taken care of. We're going to take care of you by the government, funded through coercion, and coercion used on doctors, hospitals, nurses, medical practitioners of all kinds and all sorts, force used on them to make sure that they service you. No, none of this voluntary transaction, none of this idea of choice, none of using your mind or the doctor's mind or the pharmacy's mind to make decisions about what is best. <clears throat> no. The so-called right to health care is a right to enslave all of us to the medical bureaucracy, to the bureaucrats who will tell us what kind of health care we should pursue. But this is the defendant of capitalism saying we have a right to health care. But you're not going to all of a sudden create an environment. Well, let's just talk about her plan, right? Yeah. We're not all of a sudden going to have Medicare fall. How about later? How about slowly? Yeah, and you had a Twitter battle. Yeah, and not even with her, right? I think she just let me go. But, um, <laughs> you know, if you look at her plan, there's just things that just have no chance of passing. You know. Um so it's a practical issue. Practical. Nobody's going to pass this. Nobody's going to have to make it happen. And, of course, all the arguments he's going to make are, econo are, are, are economic arguments, yeah, financial Things that just don't make sense. Like, so part of her plan says employers will take the money that we were paying for insurance and put that into the med payment for Medicare for all for their employees. Now, she had the choice of saying, let's increase payroll taxes by a certain amount. Now, why is that? I mean, he, he comes up with all kind of convoluted reasons here why that doesn't work. But why wouldn't that work? All you do is you take the stuff that employs the health insurance premiums and pay it now to the government instead of to an insurance company. That's what she's proposing. 
if you're a statist, if you're a socialist, if you believe in Medicare for all, why would that not work? And if you're not, and that doesn't increase taxes. Now, it doesn't work numbers wise, but what's his objection? Would have been the more viable way, but we, what she chose was something called a head tax, which says for my companies, any company that has more than 50 employees, rather than paying a higher payroll tax, we're going to charge you the average of the last three years plus an inflator um, each year for each one of your employees. Now, that means that in her mind that we'll be paying $7,500 to pick a number per year per employee. Now, for somebody who's making $200,000 a year, Okay, that's not bad, but what's the impact on someone who's making $10 an hour or $12 an hour or $30,000 a year? Right. If you know if you you have to hire somebody and the, the payroll cost is instead of 6.12% um, or whatever it is, right, you're having to pay $7,500 per year, you're going to have second thoughts. Slow about, hiring. Right, you're going to yeah. have second thoughts about sure. hiring that person. Even worse, as you evolve into her plan, you're going to see companies cut payroll benefits because they know if they push their costs down leading into the plan for the calculations, it's All going to cost them true, less per, so per employee, and he that's going to create a additional right. problem. Right. It's just not thought out. Right. So it's a right. So it's not thought out. So maybe Bernie's plan is more thought out, or maybe somebody can take Elizabeth's plan and make it more realistic. These are the arguments against Medicare for all. Because no uh, the Cadillac plans go up. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, look, for, uh, for the Dallas Mavericks, it cost me, for a family of four, my, we self-insure, and my insurance costs are $29,900 per year. But I'm okay with that because our insurance is great, and it's a great premium for our employees. Under Medicare for All, they're going to take a huge step back in what they get. And like to your point with unions, for their Cadillac plans, you're going to have a lot of people that are very upset that Medicare for All doesn't provide the quality of care that they're used to. But everybody gets it, and it's a right going to create huge transitional problems. So when I look at this whole thing, though, right, so we've got these policies and you're saying that they're, they can't work, except the American people are, a lot of people right. think they're, they're good ideas. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the landscape, right, and on the left, and you see we've got new entrants, I think, that mm -hmm. are saying we're going too far left. Let's try and be a little bit more moderate. You've got like Bloomberg. Deval Patrick. Mm -hmm. Deval Patrick, we've got Bloomberg coming in. I think what happens there is it hurts the moderates because it takes it, they all fracture, and then you end up with Elizabeth Warren more likely to have a path to success. I'm not yes. so concerned. Like, when the Bloomberg comes in, I think that's good. I think they're looking to be power brokers. I don't think they're necessarily looking to win. So if, you have, if you're getting down to the convention and you've got an X number of delegates and you have influence, I think that's a good thing for Michael Bloomberg and that takes the Democratic Party to the center because you need your delegates to have a, have a candidate, right? Yeah. So, I'm so not is that reinforced by the whole proportional representation they have now in the primaries, that if you get 15%, yeah, you get 15% Yeah, this is all about the, the election. Delegates. It's kind of boring past, stuff. Yeah, there's some good you stuff in a minute. All, Winner, yeah, it's, or, or you could put a majority together before the convention. Yeah, and so the, it, changes, it changes the calculus, if you will. Well, so, uh, Tom Steyer tweeted at you, only one person here is diverting attention from reality at Mark Cuban, right. and the reality is, is that we need a wealth tax, according to Tom Steyer. Look, I'm not opposed to a wealth tax. Notice that? He's not opposed to a wealth tax. The defender of capitalism, the billionaire, is not opposed to a wealth tax. Then why would anybody else be opposed to a wealth tax? Out there. If the billionaires want to pay it, and, and again, you, you hear the same thing from all of them. Bill Gates, uh, Warren Buffett, they all want taxes to go up for themselves. Now, he's going to be opposed to a tax in a minute. He's not opposed to a tax, but it gets the job done. Does it get the one the job? thing that I'm yeah. opposed to is wasting my money. I so he, he's opposed to wasting his money. So he's opposed to a tax because it doesn't work. He's a pure pragmatist like all of these guys. Like all of these guys. He's opposed to a tax because it doesn't work. Maybe they can increase a different tax on him that will work. I mean, that's Warren Buffett and, and, and uh, Bill Gates want to increase all the other taxes. Say it again. Businesses cannot survive if their communities are, if there's social unrest in our communities. So he's worried about social unrest. So what he's really trying to do, and I hear this a lot from rich people, we need to bribe people so that they're not going out into the streets and, and breaking windows. And the only way to bribe them is I pay more taxes and it's redistributed to them. So it's okay to raise my taxes if it'll reduce the, the probability of riots in the streets that might hurt me. You can't open the store, you can't do business. But is a wealth tax really going to pay for all of these no, plans? Of That's not. the problem. It's like you say it's a wealth tax, would they say. Is that the problem? They won't pay for these things? Isn't it the problem that it's their money? 
that you're taxing savings and investment, that you're taxing production, and what are you doing with that money? You're throwing it away. You're consuming it. You're destroying with it. You're not doing anything of value with it. Isn't that the problem? Not that it can't pay for all the plans. What if it could? Then you'd be for it? Just on the top 1%, it's, right. you, you're going to have to raise Come taxes on, Maria, on everybody. You know well, yeah, better. of course you will. Maybe but I don't, I don't look at the wealth tax in a vacuum, right? It's part of a bigger tax. And of course, they're going to try to tax everybody as much as they can. The question is, how do you spend it and what kind of results well, do you get? Ta- taxes hurt the economy. The more taxes you put on, the more they hurt the economy. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, uh, Steve Wolf says that, but Mark Cuban is like, yeah, well, I don't really believe that. This cartoonish idea that you're sitting on billions of dollars in cash. They don't realize right. no, it's that's an true. asset. Yeah, no, and, and when you tax the asset, you're going to affect the value of yeah. that. Well, the I other thing is, how do you value stuff? I mean, you've got art. I mean, rich yeah. people buy a lot of stuff. You know, you, you own so, the Mavericks. So, how, how do you value this stuff? So, I so now the problem with the wealth tax is this. Notice this. It's not that it's confiscating your money. It's not that it's destroying production and investment. It's that you're going to have to sell your investments. And that's going to drive their value down, and other people will be hurt by that as well. All true. But again, such trivial arguments. But this is all he can muster. One of the economists that were listed in um, her plan, and I asked that very question because I did the math for myself. Look, I'm the luckiest guy in the world, and I I thank goodness every day um, how blessed I am. But I did the math, and her 6% wealth tax would would require me to pay more after the first year and a half than I have in cash. And so I sent an email to one of the economists, and I said, look, did you guys do take into consideration liquidity um, when you defined your wealth tax and modeled it out? That's a good question. They said no. No, They they think they should. So they think you could sell off a business and hope for the best. So what I think would happen is if you're forced to sell off assets and everybody in a similar situation is forced to sell off assets, then you'll see something like we saw in the 80s where the Japanese and foreign investors will come in. So, you- so now the bad thing is, now the bad thing is, notice, I mean, this is, this is so era of Trump kind, like, so now the real evil of a wealth tax is that all these wealthy guys are going to have to sell assets and that, ooh, foreigners are going to buy them. Oh my God. This is the worst case scenario. Foreigners, like the Japanese and the Chine- uh, Chinese or the, or, the, or the Europeans, or maybe even the Saudis are going to buy all the assets because these guys will be liquidating them. And that's the real evil of a wealth tax is it's going to cause foreign ownership of businesses to go up. I mean, really? It, it is so nutty. It is so pathetic. It's so weak that it's no surprise that we are losing the battle for capitalism. It's no surprise that the left has captured the imagination of young people. It's See Saudi Arabia and foreign Arabia. entities come in and just buy up everything because there's that no. There's oh, Elizabeth has. Warren is counting on China to bail out or bail yeah, out. or Saudi Arabia, right? Well, just, you, you make a good point because the other day Bernie Sanders said it, it, there should be no billionaires. Yeah, there should be. I mean, what do we want? Do we want the billionaires to go to Europe to go to China? I mean, already look, we're I'm not leaving. More. No matter how much you tax me, I'm not leaving this. <laughs> there you go. So he's saying it doesn't matter how much you tax me, I'm not leaving. So it, you know, it doesn't matter. Right. But so he I said don't care. it's immoral for billionaires. Yeah, to- look, it, everybody's getting very Trumpian these days, right? You, Donald That's Trump true. was brilliant at picking, at looking at his base and saying, what group of people are they not going to care about that I can pick on? Now Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders I'm have picked up that skill, right? Mm. And they said, billionaires, you know, our base, let's throw them under yeah. the bus because no one's going to stand up and support them. So, you know, Elizabeth Warren is is playing the, is becoming very Trumpian and she's taking a big page out of the Trump playbook. Do you think she's going to be the candidate? Um, no. So he's right. Elizabeth Warren is becoming very Trumpian in, in that sense. Pick, pick somebody that everybody loves to hate. Pick somebody who you can blame all the problems of the world on and, um, and then run on that. And, and she is. So and, and, uh, that's always been a strategy of, of kind of authoritarian types. Donald Trump made it into an art form. He, he did it particularly well. And uh, I think for the first time in American history, really... Uh, launched a campaign, ran a campaign, and won the presidency basically on the idea of blaming the other for all of our problems. Uh, Tyler asks, are there any business leaders today who stand up for capitalism with moral conviction? No. Nobody nobody significant. There might be some small business leaders. There might be some, but no, nobody. Literally nobody. Even the ones who are semi-libertarians. Look at 
Look at um, uh, the guy who, who used to own Whole Foods. Um, uh, ugh, I forget his name. I, I mean, he's coined a new term, conscious capitalism, because capitalism is not good enough. We need conscious capitalism. We need capitalism where we pay our workers well and where we care about the quality of the product that we sell people. Con you know, yeah, I mean, if you're in Whole Foods and you charge massive margins and you uh, serve a clientele that's quite wealthy, then, yeah, you can afford to pay people more than Walmart can. But if everybody paid people the way Whole Foods did, there'd be no Walmart. And where would poor people shop? It's nonsense like that, as if to make money in a capitalist economy, one has to treat your employees poorly. As if to make money in a capitalist economy, one treats your customers, suppliers, shareholders, debt holders, everybody else poorly. I mean, it's just, they create a fiction about capitalism and then have to moderate it by calling it conscious capitalism. Or people like Jeff Bezos or, 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 or Zuckerberg or any of these guys who either say nothing or constantly apologizing. Wikipedia says Mark Cuban is a big fan of Ayn Rand. Yeah, he's a fan of the Fountainhead, not of Ayn Rand's. He's, he, I mean, Wikipedia is not to be trusted. And in this case, uh, I can tell you factually, he's never read Atlas Shrugged. He has read the Fountainhead. He loves the Fountainhead. He often says that when he feels down in life, he goes reads the Fountainhead to give him a pick-me-up. Pick uh, but that's about it in terms of his fanhood of Ayn Rand. The fact that you read a book and like a book does not make you have any understanding, as you can see, of her philosophical ideas. Not even of the book, not even of the philosophical ideas expressed in the book. No, Howard Walk would never say any of the things Mark Cuban just said. Oh, I was lucky. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to leave this country no matter how many people come and take my stuff away from me. Oh, I think health care is a right. On and on and on and on. All right, let's see. Uh, so, pff, pathetic, pathetic defense of capitalism. Okay, what we can do now is either we can go, we can go and um, do a video by Robert Reich, the leftist, on should we abolish billionaires, um, and, and, and I can point out all the lies, or we can go to Professor Richard Wolff about banks. All right, let's do, I mean, both are such liars. So pathetic. Um, let's do uh, Robert Reich, if, if you guys are up for it. You up for Robert Reich? All right. Ah, super kill says Wolf. Those are your options. What do you want? Okay, super chat. I'm going to le leave you. So you've got Reich or Wolf. Who do you want me to go after? Um, yeah, oh, we got one vote for Wolf. That's it. Nobody else is voting either way. Wolf. Okay, we'll go to Wolf. All right. We can do that. There's Wolf. Particularly bad lit, you know. Okay, we, Wolf is winning. Okay, here we go. So here's Wolf being asked a question about too many banks in America. This is Richard Wolf with a response to an Ask Prof Wolf question from our Patreon community. And in particular, from Liz Mednick who asks about what she sees where she lives, a proliferation of banks. Can you believe Richard Wolf has a Patreon account? He's using a capitalist tool to raise money. I thought we're not supposed to be greedy, not wanting money. Um, and he takes questions, and he, oh, not to mention all the technology he's using right now to live stream this or whatever. But, all right, ignore the fact that he takes Patreon. I mean, a good Marxist wouldn't do that. Let's, let's see what he has to say about banks. Something I actually know something about. Literally occupying all four corners of an intersection, spreading around the community as if a kind of hysterical process of plunking down bank branches was underway. She worries that this is crazy, that this is too many banks chasing after a limited number of depositors and it won't end well. And she wants my response. Good question. Okay, so there's a pro proliferation of banks, the bank branches everywhere. You go to a corner, there are four different branches on the four corners. 
it's just crazy the number of banks that we have in the United States, the number of bank branches we have in the United States. It's insanity. It's really, really bad. Now, the funny thing is in the beginning of, of Wolf's uh, answer, he is actually says some things that are, God forbid, true. And then he goes completely nuts. But let's start with the truth. Correct observation. Let's see what it means. More than ever in today's capitalism, everything is financialized. Now, one of the things you'll note, and this is true of the, of the Robert Reich video, of many of the videos, is that nobody actually defends capitalism. So capitalism is the mixed economy today. Anything that's happening is a consequence of capitalism if it's happening today. Indeed, in history, the world, according to Richard Wolff, another video I saw of his, the world has always been capitalist. Why? Because there have always been markets. There's always been some semblance of private property in any successful culture. So the world, according to Richard Wolff, has always been capitalist. So every problem that's ever existed ever in human history, at least since the launch of agriculture, is the fault of capitalism. Because capitalism is the prevailing system always. So he blames World War I and World War II on capitalism, even though, because he thinks the Nazis are capitalists. He blames, he blames slavery on capitalism. He blames feudalism on capitalism. He blames colonialism on capitalism. When you don't define your terms, when you don't have clear definitions and understanding, you can do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. All right. Consumers spend more borrowed money often than they spend of their own earned wages, salaries, and so on. That is true. Every business borrowing wildly, especially in the last 10 years, as the government responded to the crash of 2008 by dropping interest rates to the lowest levels in history. This is the Federal Reserve, central banks, governments, not capitalism, not capitalist, not a system in which there's complete separation of economy from state, which is what capitalism is. No, this is the mixed economy in which the government rules banks. The government rules the central banks. The government determines the interest rates. The government determines the money supply. And yet he is blaming what the government is doing today in the world we live in today, in a mixed economy. He is blaming all of that. On what? On capitalism. This only system that actually opposes all of that. But everything he says about the evil of what the Federal Reserve has done is true. Of what central bankers have done is true. But that's socialism. Yeah, somebody says, and the thing that he even accuses, he claims that the Soviet Union wasn't really socialism. It was state capitalism. <laughs> so capitalism equals evils in the world. Then yeah, all right, then capitalism is awful. But he is so pathetic, so non, a non-thinker, that he can't actually, he doesn't actually define his terms. What is capitalism? Capitalism is a system in which all property is privately owned, in which the goal of the government is to protect individual rights, protect from coercion, and in which the state owns no means of production, no banks, no central banks, no money. State owns none of that. That would be a definition. Socialism is a system in which the means of production are owned by the state. The means of trade are owned by the state. That's socialism. But if you don't define your terms, you can make up anything you want. You can make up anything you want. And that's basically what he does, blaming all this on capitalism somehow. Which was an incentive, of course, for everyone in economic difficulty, a consumer, a worker, a business, a government, to borrow like crazy. Absolutely, and a consequence of government intervention. Money was rendered so cheap, and so the level of indebtedness exploded. Everybody needs to deal 
with their debts, true, with the credit system, true, and therefore everybody needs a bank. <laughs> everybody needs a bank all the time. We'll get to the number of banks in the United States in a minute. And as everybody needs a bank more and more to get cash out, to solve problems with your checking account, your savings account, your credit card, your home mortgage, and whatever else, the banks not only reap a profit bonanza, but they... Banks are not particularly profitable right now. It's pretty amazing. Profit bonanza. Banks are profit-wise below historical averages. Half of the last 10 years struggle to get back to the kind of profits that they had in the past. Uh, banks are not making huge amounts of money in spite of this debt boom, which he correctly, uh, correctly identifies. But just factually, these guys make stuff up. There's no profit bonanza. Same thing is always told to the drug companies. Ooh, the drug companies, they make so much money. But they don't. Their return on equity and return on assets are pretty average. Banks are pretty low. Somebody who invests in banks for a living, I can tell you, banks are not very profitable right now. They're not badly profitable. They're not losing money by any means. But the idea that they are hugely profitable is such bogus lying. Typical of these leftist intellectuals. And find the themselves in a tough competition for the loyalty and the business of companies, individuals, and so on. And so a mad rush of competition is underway. And that's what you're seeing. Every spare office, every spare storefront grabbed so that there can be a teller machine perhaps a teller or two that are living people, and the rest of the apparatus of a bank. Now notice, what he's saying is this mad rush of banks to open up more branches. More and more and more branches. Because the banks are trying to get the loyalty of their customers. But what is the reality, factually? Well, the fact is that over at least the last three years, the number of branches in the United States has declined. The number of branches is less and less. I mean, you can go look at the data. I have. Again, this is my field. And the number of branches in the United States is in decline. P banks are not rushing to open branches. They're rushing to close branches. Because how many of you use a branch when you can do all your banking on a phone? So, again, just lies, factual lies. It won't end well. That's it is true. chaotic. It is competition is chaotic. The socialists don't like competition. Competition, you know, you can't tell who the winners and losers are going to be. Competition means that people are pursuing their own self-interest, independent of a central planner. They're independent of an economics professor, independent of an expert, independent of a philosopher king. Competition means people are actually pursuing their ideas, pursuing their interests free of asking for permission. It's chaos. They hate chaos. They want order. The best examples of capitalist inefficiency that one could look for. Now, why do America has so many banks? Because, man, America has a lot of banks. I don't know. Some of you live overseas and you don't know uh, the extent to which the American banking system is massive. America has... 5,600 banks, 5,600 independent depository institutions. Now, anybody know how many banks there were 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, in the 1970s? What, 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 how many banks? Is this, this mad rush to open banks? Mad rush to engage in financial activity? How many banks existed back then? Actually, 20,000 banks. And why were there so many banks? Was this a phenomenon of capitalism? Does capitalism cause a proliferation of banks? I mean, you think a socialist, 40 years ago there were 20,000. Today they're 5,600. The number shrunk by almost 75%. And why were there 20,000? No other country has anywhere close to that number of banks per capita. See, no. All right. So... There were 20,000 banks in the 1970s in the United States. Today, the 5,600 banks 
so there's been a shrinkage of 75% in the number of banks. You'd think an economist like Professor Wolf would know this. And of course, the reason there were 20,000 banks in the United States was not because of capitalism. The reason was because of financial regulations. What are the financial regulations that made it possible, for, made it necessary for 20,000 banks to exist? Well, it was state regulations. States basically did not allow their banks to merge and, and branch across state lines. In some states, you couldn't have more than one branch. You couldn't have more than one branch. So that if you wanted to have a, a bank in your neighborhood, you'd have to open a new bank. So during the 19th century, 20th century, you had a massive proliferation of banks because of regulation. No other country was like this. Canada, for example, where you could branch anywhere, you could consolidate across state lines, you could establish a Canadian bank from coast to coast, has five big banks and a bunch of little banks and less than, I think, 30 or 40 banks overall. And they, by the way, have had no banking crises in their history. The United States is at 12 because we have too many banks, because of the proliferation of banks. Finally, when Congress did something that made sense, it happens once in a while, in 1994, Congress eliminated all the regulations at the state level that prohibit bank mergers, bank consolidation, bank branch openings across state lines, and allowed banks to go anywhere they wanted. Finally, when that happened in 1994, since then you've had a lot of consolidation in the banking sector. But again, It's not capitalism that created the problem. It's state intervention, state involvement. And there's no proliferation of bank branches in spite of what you might think. And the fact that there are four bank branches on a corner means that you've got options. You can choose which banks to use. Richard Wolf would want to have one bank, a government bank, the same government that is flooding the market with dollars and lowering interest rates to zero, that government, he wants them, those people, to own the one bank, but we won't call it a monopoly, God forbid, because he's against monopolies, that one bank owned by the people. It'll be a people's bank, democratically run, democratically functioning. That's the kind of world Richard Wolff wants. But first... First, he should get the facts about this world right. He doesn't have them. Number of branches in the United States are shrinking, primarily because of technology. Think about it for a minute. If, as you have in my neighborhood, banks on all four corners of an, of an intersection, here's what you know. With modern computers, one bank could easily handle the business now being handled by four. Of course, and, and ideally, the government could handle the business of 20. But the only reason there are four banks and not one is because of regulation that some central planner put in place, thinking that they were doing what is good for, quote, society, rather than letting the market dictate. Because the market would dictate not four banks on a corner, maybe two, maybe just one, and that's where we're heading, by the way, with bank consolidation. I strongly predict that within 20 years, there'll be less than 1,000 banks in the United States, and you won't have four branches on a corner because all banking will be done from your iPhone. Maybe, I mean, ideally, if the government stays out of it, there probably wouldn't be more than 50 banks in the United States. Good luck with the keeping the, bank, the government out of it, particularly with people like Richard Wolff who call themselves economists and pretend to be such. The same computer could easily handle it. The same or a, re a larger number of teller machines could exist in one room yeah. or antechamber yeah. uh, of an office as in... That's why there's bank consolidation right now. Bank consolidation, Elizabeth Warren, wants to end because she, she says it's anti-competitive. So the socialists have to decide. Do they want competition or don't they? And what kind of competition? 
And how do you measure competition? But the fact is the banking industry is consolidating. There are fewer and fewer branches. There are fewer and fewer banks. But what Wolf really wants is one bank run by the people, one computer, dictating everything to all of us. For the duplication of security personnel, of clerks and so on, all a product is legendarily of regulation. idiotic, ditto for the safe deposit boxes, and so on and so on. This is a vast waste of resources. True, and if we didn't had regulation, we'd be like Canada, with basically five banks. Serving what end? Well, after a few years, some of these banks will collapse and be replaced by another kind of store, the chaotic and inefficient competition among capitalists. Yeah, they'll be replaced by store, and then there we will have also inefficient competition between capitalists because we'll have lots of different clothing stores, and each clothing store, I mean, they could consolidate. We could have one big, giant, workers-run clothing store. Run like a co-op, not on profits, all guided by a computer programmed by government officials, the same ones who put together that wonderful Obama health care exchange. We'll end up with only one or two left. And guess what? They will reward us for this capitalist wasteful competition by becoming monopolies or oligopolies when a very few are in a position to jack up the rates because we're used to banking in our neighborhood. So there you go. The solution, of course, is what? Because capitalism gives us too many banks and then too few banks. What are we going to do? If there's only one bank, it can charge more for the safe deposit and the box and the checking the account. You see the picture. It's chaotic. It's inefficient. It's the way capitalism works. Good observation. Liz Mednick. All right, let's get him off my screen. It's pretty disgusting. I mean, this is what they do over and over and over again. They lie. They make up stuff. They engage in pseudo-economics. in pseudo-facts. They never offer a solution. Their solution is, again, their solution is collectivism. Their solution is national, nationalization. Their solution is to get rid of private property. Their solution is to have one bank. But God forbid, not one bank run by the profit motive. Their solution is to one bank, one bank, that is basically run by the government for the people. No profit, no private property, no private interests. He's an authoritarian, the worst kind of authoritarian. He might call the Soviet Union state capitalism, but the Soviet Union is exactly the system that his ideas have to manifest, and he has to know it. Somebody with a PhD in economics, spouting the kind of nonsense that he does, is a massive evader. Is somebody who evades reality constantly, evades facts constantly, evades the economic theory constantly. And according to objectivism, the source of all evil is evasion. Richard Wolff is evil. He's a bad human being. He's immoral because of his evasions. He's dishonest. Yet, people love him. He appeals to young people. He appeals to their ignorance. He appeals to their naivete. He appeals to their lack of ability to think for themselves. He appeals to their lack of education. He appeals to their altruism and collectivism that they have been filled with throughout their lives. Now, I mentioned this in previous videos where I've talked about Richard Wolff. He also talks with hatred in his voice. He is an ugly, ugly soul. He has an ugly, ugly mind. He has an ugly, ugly spirit. He is an evil man through and through. And you can see that justice pervades in this world. He's not a happy person. 
He suffers for his evasions. All right, let's go through some Super Chat questions. Isn't the Federal Reserve a private company? No, 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 no. Who appoints the chairman of the Federal Reserve? President does, and it has to be approved by Congress. What private company has the president of the United States appointed CEO? Who gets the profits from the Federal Reserve? Federal Reserve makes a lot of money. Some years, huge amounts of money. Who makes the profits? The government does. Profits are received by the Treasury as income, not the banks that supposedly own the Federal Reserve. Who appoints the other members of the board who make decisions at the Fed? The government does. The president does. The Federal Reserve is through and through a government institution. It is nominally owned by banks. But the banks don't run it, don't appoint the CEO, and don't benefit from the profits. So no, the Federal Reserve is not a private company. It is a public government institution disguised as a private company. Do you think if a business leader, a CEO similar in banking, supported capitalism, free market, they would soon be fired? No, not necessarily. Take John Allison, who for years and years and years was a massive, huge supporter of capitalism. CEO of one of the most successful banks in the last 40 years, BB&T Corporation. Nobody fired him. He left, but he left because he, he retired. So no, I actually don't think that is the case. Somebody with a kind of moral authority who is successful, who has actually built up the business, who advocates for capitalism morally, I, I, I think that's the only way the world will change. If when businessmen are willing to do that, are willing to stand up for capitalism, nothing else will happen. As long as we have, you can look John Allison up on the internet. There's a bunch of videos of his lectures, all recommended. As long as we have people like Mark Cuban, as long as we have people like Zuckerberg and Bill Gates and Buffett, as long as that, their defense of themselves, their defense of capitalism is what we have, we lose. Uh, Ayn Rand's final last speech she ever gave was about sanction of the victim. It was about the sanction businessmen give to their own destroyers, to the politicians, the intellectuals, the professors who will have them destroyed. Their inability and unwillingness to defend capitalism morally is what is destroying this country. They are the most potentially influential people who could have an impact out there, but they don't, partially because they don't get it, they don't want to get it, they're cowards, and they're, they're intellectually corrupt, which is sad, because the genius is otherwise incredibly productive human beings, admirable human beings in every other respect. Ben Shapiro states capitalism results in a sort of reality-forced altruism. I talked to him about this and why it's wrong. I may not want to help you, I may dislike you, but if I don't give you a product you want, I will starve. Any thoughts? Well, no, none of that is true. If I don't give you a product you want, there's no you here. I mean, I don't want a lot of products that people sell. They don't starve. They find somebody else who does want. So it's true. It's true that you're not going to be successful unless you convince people that they should ha want your goods. At least some people, never all of them. So capitalism requires engaging in win-win transactions with other people. So it helps other people, but that is not what altruism is. Altruism is not, and you can listen to all of my lectures, I repeat this over and over and over again. Altruism is not about helping other people. Altruism is not a moral system that is geared towards helping other people. If it was, then capitalists would be the greatest moral heroes. Even for Ben Shapiro, capitalists are not the greatest moral heroes. Moral heroes. 
The Jewish religion does not say that the greatest saints, the equivalent of saints in Judaism, are businessmen. But they should be. Because nobody has benefited the human race more than these self-interested, profit-seeking businessmen. Yet, when does he get more credit? Only when he stops being a businessman. When he stops benefiting for himself. Altruism is fundamentally anti-self-interest. Not fundamentally pro-helping others. It's the self-interest they despise. So, for example, if you work, create, build, make stuff, and thus help your neighbor, that's not, that doesn't count morally. Nobody supports you morally. But if you suffer, if you give all your money away, if you go live in India with the poorest of the poor and live a miserable, pathetic life, then you get sainted. Altruism is a term coined by Augustine Comte, C-O-M-T-E. And Augustine Comte says that the purpose of life under altruism is to serve others with no benefit to yourself. The fact that you benefit makes your actions amoral. The fact that you benefit makes your action amoral. So altruism rejects the idea of win-win relationships. That's why altruism has to reject capitalism. It rejects the idea that by helping myself, I help other people. By helping other people, I help myself. It rejects that. It is about you helping other people no matter what, at all costs. And the more you suffer, the more noble and virtuous you are. Yeah, Shane asked, are doctors, teachers, etc. Simply just people, business people. When it, yes, of course they are. They're making themselves better off. They're selling a service. They're selling a product in exchange for. They get money. They get a salary. And they get the pleasure and enjoyment of providing that service. But... Businessmen, successful businessmen, do it on a scale. That's why they make so much money. And businessmen are the greatest beneficiaries of mankind, more than teachers, doctors, and all these other individuals combined. You don't get the wealth to have teachers without J.P. Morgan and J.D. Rockefeller. You don't have the wealth to build hospitals and to do to do research into healthcare without the great wealth creators that are the business people. The business people on scale, not the business people who are, you know, self-proprietors. The successful business people. Big business. All right. So, no, altruism is evil because altruism rejects your Self-interest as being moral, it tells you that you must reject your interests. That morality demands that you never think about yourself. That morality demands that you sacrifice your own interests for the sake of others. That's what morality is, the negation of your own interest in the interests of other people. All right, have you seen the movie L-U-C-E based on a play? I don't think I have. I don't think I have. I'll look for it. Um, would you kindly look into Copa YouTube situation? As written, any remotely kid-friendly YouTube creator would be fined $42,000 per video violation for having ads. I'll look at it. And I, I you know, all right. What is wrong with pragmatism as a defense against brutal ideological enforcement of a faulty principle? That didn't seem flawed at the time. Well, it just is not a good or successful strategy. And it's, as a way of thinking, it is ultimately destructive.
Pragmatism is the negation of the long term. It's the negation of principle, which helps you think long term. It's the negation of thinking. It's the negation of reason. It's whatever goes, whatever seems to work in the moment without the consideration of what impact that has long term. So pragmatism as an ideology, as a methodology, is terrible. And I've said this over and over again, and this relates to the Mark Cuban video. People want to be good. People vote their morality. Between a battle between these, the two, it doesn't work, and, but it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. We'll, we'll, we'll win. And until you can say, no, it's not the right thing to do, they will win. So maybe for a short period of time, this is all you can do. Because you don't have, I don't know, the moral language to oppose it. But then realize you are going to win, lose long term. Capitalist Nick asked, why is Medicare for all such a poison pill for any candidate? Juan pushed it hard and it almost killed her election bid. I don't think, she, I don't think that's what killed her election bid. What killed Juan's election bid is that she lied and distorted on how she was going to pay for it. And I did a show on that. And everybody saw it. Even the left said, wait a minute, you're making these numbers up. That's what killed her election bid. Medicare for all won't kill the election, but indeed all of them are for Medicare for all. Every single one of them people on the left. The only difference is some of them are for Medicare for all with private insurance, which is not a sustainable model, but they, and others are Medicare for all with no private insurance, complete replacement of private insurance. And it's not clear which one of those two will, will win. But no, what killed one is that she lied about the numbers. And even some on the left won't tolerate that kind of lying. That's what ultimately uh, destroyed her. Um, all right. I think we'll call it a, a, a show. I apologize for the break in the middle. Uh, I had a power outage here, and it took a while for the generator, my batteries to kick in. And during that period, uh, I couldn't see whether you could see me or not. Turned out you could. Uh, but anyway, we got back on track. I, I lost Facebook in the process. Facebook is more finicky about these things. YouTube uh, somehow stayed connected in spite of all that. So uh, thank you all. Thank you all for watching today. Don't forget that if you like the show, if you find value in it, then show your appreciation by supporting the show. I will do the Robert Reich video another time, so I'm not giving that up. Uh, there are other videos I will do. Uh, you guys voted for Wolf, so you got Wolf. Um, and um, don't forget to share my videos, particularly the short ones that come out, which are much easier for people to watch and uh, much more focused. These long ones, yeah, I guess are more difficult for people, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed and uh, appreciate your appreciation through your on bookshow.com slash support or on subscribe stuff, subscribe com slash your on bookshow. All right. Thanks, everybody, and I will probably talk to you tomorrow. Maybe I'll show the Robert Reich video tomorrow. Maybe we'll find something else to do. We'll see. Bye, everybody.